Well, I am so glad to uh, invite uh, our special guest with us today. Terry Williams is with the Florida Baptist Convention. Uh, he's in charge of the uh, music department. He not only uh, in ch is in charge of it, but he runs it too. All right, and so there's there's sometimes a difference, isn't there, brother? <laughs> but Terry does a great job, and so let's give him an Emmanuel Baptist Church welcome this morning, brother Terry. Well, thank you. Man, have I been blessed today. Good gracious. That's tooting for Jesus right there. That's incredible. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Pastor Jeff, thank you, brother. It's good to reconnect with you. I knew him before you did. <laughs> Met him when he was down at First Baptist Church of Winter Haven and uh, had some opportunity to spend some time and get to know him there. And then I also knew John before you did. Absolutely, John. Uh, John is, is uh, just one of those guys. He's a spark plug. And every time you get around John, you just kind of light up when you get around John. And uh, it's awesome to reconnect with you. And ladies that sing with us in Florida Worship Choir, God bless y'all. Good to see you. And um, it's just a real thrill to be with you today. I'm so encouraged by this place. Oh, I'm not talking about just the building. I'm talking about you. I'm just so encouraged. <laughs> encouraged by this place. It's a wonderful time of refreshing worship this morning and enc encouraging worship, encouraging fellowship among you. I can sense it and feel it already. Um, I live in Ocala. I just live right up the road from you. Been there for um, almost 24 years, Pastor. I was minister of music and worship at First Baptist Church of Ocala uh, for 10 and a half years. Matter of fact, many of you who've been in the area very long will remember back in the early 90s, in 1991, our church burned to the ground. How many of you remember that? Okay, God bless you. you were <laughs> but First Baptist Church of Ocala, those that don't know, burned to the ground. I mean, it, it had over four and a half million dollars worth of damage. Yeah, yeah, well, they thought it was the new minister of music. I'd only been there two weeks. And... Uh, they said the church was on fire, but not literally. But it, 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 uh, it went up in smoke, holy smoke. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was amazing. But, but uh, what the devil meant for evil, God meant for good. And, and the church relocated and rebuilt. And, and uh, I, my family and I had only lived there two weeks. And my children were like six and eight at the time. And they said, we're going to have to go find a new church. I said, no, that's just the building. No, I'm not going to find a new church. And so we had ten and a half years of great ministry there at First Baptist Church. And now for the last 14 years, John, 14 years, it's hard to believe, yeah. Last 14 years, I've been with the Florida Baptist Convention, and, um, and he's right, the music and worship ministries of the Florida Baptist Convention have been serving there. I still live in Ocala, travel from there, do my work from Ocala, and God is really blessed. We're having a wonderful, wonderful time. My wife, Erlene, would be here today with me, but... Our daughter who had a birthday yesterday won out over you and won out over me. And, and she had an ulter ulterior motive to going out and spending the weekend with my daughter who had a birthday. Our daughter has four little girls. And so she went out, she went out to spend time with our four little grandgirls out in West Florida. They're in Fort Walton Beach. And after lunch today, Pastor, I'm driving out there. And so, uh, so that's where she is. Erlene and I, this coming summer, will be married 37 years. Oh, yeah. Long time. Long time. And we have two children and five grandchildren. So God has blessed us really good. My wife is a grandmother. I'm not old enough to be one of those yet. So my grandchildren call me Papa T. Makes, makes, more, it makes me feel a whole lot better because I'm not old enough to be a grandpa, brother. I'm really not. Oh, by the way, I'll tell you something else I knew before you did. I knew Becky Collins before you did. Hey, brother, how you doing? And Miss McMurtry, how are you doing? Good to see you. Pardon us just for a minute. God bless y'all. It's good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> Becky and I went to junior college together. Absolutely. So we knew, knew each other about 10 or 15 years ago. Absolutely. <laughs> so we've known each other a long, long time. Well, Pastor said uh, he encouraged us to come, and we put this date on the calendar. Godly, I don't know how long ago it was. We put it on the calendar, and we've been looking forward to this. And 
praying for our opportunity to spend some time with you today, and, and I'm really, really thrilled to be able to meet you. And for those of you that I have met before or met in passing, it's a joy to re renew the acquaintance for the new friends. It's a joy to meet you as well, and I'm um, really looking forward to our time together. Pastor said to go about an hour and a half, so we'll... we'll <laughs> No, we won't go that long. I promise he won't go over an hour. I'm just kidding. I'm <laughs> just, kidding, just kidding. So we're going to spend some time this morning talking about what God desires from us, what God desires from the believer, what God desires from the local church, what God desires from the church today, the kingdom of God. And uh, I guess if you were to go around the room and we were to ask the question, what do you think is the main thing? And in the believer's life? What's the main thing in the church? What's the main thing that we're to be about? If we were to go around the room and say, you know, the main thing just needs to be the main thing, right? I mean, we've all heard that. Let's just let the main thing be the main thing. Well, the issue with that, the challenge with that is that everyone's, in, uh, everyone's interpretation of what that main thing is, is different. It just is. Depending on how you grew up, depending on where you were taught, where you were trained, what you read, what you believed, every one of us would probably say a little something different. Like we're, we're to be about discipleship. We're to raise people up in the nurture and the admonition of Christ. And we are. We're to be about the Great Commission. We're to be about reaching the lost for Jesus Christ. We're about making a difference and an impact in this world and in this culture that we live in. And we are. We're to be about ministry. Maybe it's ministry, meeting people at the very point of their need and ministering to people's hearts, ministering to people's lives. And we must be about these things. But everyone's interpretation of what that main thing is, is different. But today what I'd love to share with you is I'd love to share with you what God considers to be the main thing. I'd love to share with you today from the Word of God what He considers to be the most important thing in a person's life. And what he calls it, here's what he calls it. He calls it the first and great commandment. And when he said the first and great, he put a couple of adjectives there. Well, first of all, he gave it that word first. He says it's at the top of the list. It's the priority. It's the preeminence. It's the most important thing when he says it's the first. And then he says it's the great. And when he uses the word great, he means that it's above the average. He means it's above everything else that we deem important in life. He calls it the first and great. And then when he said it's a commandment, we have no choice in the matter but to obey. Is that not correct? Amen. Absolutely. Because it's the holy word of God. For years and years and years, I used to preach and teach uh, the great commandment from the New Testament passage found in Matthew chapter 22. When the, the attorney, that lawyer, approached Jesus one day, and you know how attorneys can be. Are there any lawyers in the room today? All right. Well, you know how they can be. But when this attorney, this lawyer, asked Jesus a question, and by the way, this attorney was trying to catch Jesus off guard, and he said, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? To which Jesus responded and said that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. And in that New Testament passage, he says, with all your mind. And then he says, and second is like unto it, that you go love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. I mean, he pretty well summarized right there in that one passage. He pretty well summarized everything that we are to be about. Loving God and loving others. But here lately, Pastor, uh, God has just really poured into me uh, this Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy chapter 6 passage on the Great Commandment. Matter of fact, they call this the first law of mention. Anytime you find in the Old Testament, anytime you go back to those first five books and you find something that's a principle or a command or an order from God, and it's the first time that it's ever mentioned in Scripture, you call that the first law of mention. And the very first law of mention of this great commandment is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And we're going to read that passage for you in just a minute. But before we do, I've gotten to this place in life and I've gotten to this place in ministry. I've gotten to this place in the life of the church where I realize not only are we diverse, and we are. All you've got to look, do is look around the room and you'll see how diverse we are. Look around the room. Isn't that unique? Look at, look at everybody. Isn't that unique? Look how diverse we are. I mean, huh? I mean, there's, there's short people, there's tall people, you know, there's young people, there's old people, there's silver hair, gray hair, blue hair, no hair, black hair, 
There's all kinds. I mean, we're just different. We're very unique. But not only are we unique and not only are we different uh, in this room, but all you've got to do is step out the doors of this church and you'll see how diverse we've become. And our diversity is even getting greater. All you have to do is go to the mall, go to a restaurant, and you'll see how diverse we're becoming. And it's the reality. And here's the thing. You can't resist it. It's coming. It's here. It's on its way. And it's going to continue to be diverse. And what we've got to do is we've got to find a way that if we're going to get serious about ministry, if we're going to get serious about church, if we're going to get serious about our own uh, spiritual life, what we've got to do is we've got to adjust, number one. And number two, we've got to obey. Let's adjust to what's going on. This is the world we live in. And let's just make the adjustment. And now let's go obey. Let's find out what the scripture says. Let's see how we can make an impact. Let's see how we can make a difference in this world around us and just simply be obedient. That's what the scripture is asking us to do. For if we were to keep looking back, I remember the good old days. I remember the glory days. I remember when it was a whole lot easier. I remember when church was a one-size-fit-all. When everything was a whole lot simpler. When everything was a whole lot easier. I mean, it was so much easier to have church 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And it was. It's a different day. We sing different songs. We sing different songs in a different way. We sing different songs uh, just for the sake of singing different songs. <laughs> mm. I have to ask everywhere I go, Pastor, uh, that if I'm going to lead worship or if I'm going to teach or preach, uh, what's the protocol? What do I wear? Because I've been to some churches before where you, you show up and you, you, know, you kind of look like this and you show up and the pastor's wearing jeans. And I went, oh, don't go. And if I'd have just known, I could have worn jeans too. It's just gotten so diverse. It's not the same. But here's what's good about the kingdom of God. And here's what's good about God. God says that His mercies are new every day. And God's creativity did not stop a long time ago. God continues to be creative. And I love the fact that we can come just as we are. Isn't that good? That's a pretty good concept, isn't it? Come just as you are. Just as we are. Amen. Amen and amen. I don't know why I'm doing all this. I don't even know why. I mean, I'm, it's, not, it's not even in my notes. I'm not even giving the introduction yet. All, 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 I can, all I can say is that it's exciting to be a part of this day. It just is. But here's the huge question. What are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with the opportunity that God has afforded us? What are we going to do with the responsibility that God has given us? What kind of foundations are we going to lay? You're in a brand new church. I say brand new, but relatively, this is a brand new church. This is a wonderful facility. Do you know how many uh, companies, do you know how many businesses would love to have this storefront on that highway? You know, kind of visibility that God has given you right here? This is incredible. This is storefront. This is, I mean, God gave you something of value right here. Now, what are you going to do with it? Right? Wow. What kind of foundation are you going to lay? What kind of footing and what kind of groundwork are you going to lay as a church? What about you as a believer? What about you as a family? What are you building your faith upon? Let's talk about that. Y'all too? Huh? Come on now, let's do this. That's another thing I like about the church today. It doesn't have to be so formal. I mean, hey, he's a holy God. We get that. And he is a holy God. But I guarantee you one thing. When we're in his presence, and when he makes his visitation, when he makes his way into our heart, when he makes his way into this place, he is family. Isn't that wonderful? And we've got to receive him as family. He's our father. It's a relationship. And it's okay. In other words, the big word today is relax. Relax. Everything's going to be okay. If we will obey. <laughs> I mean, that's the way I was raised. 
You know, my life went so much better under my father's leadership. <laughs> Everything went so much better under his leadership if I would just obey. But things got really tense and tight when I didn't obey. So it's okay as long as we'll obey. obey. Now, we don't bring them on. But we don't like that word obey. Sounds like pig Latin, obey. But even the older that we get, I'll be 60 this year. I was telling pastor, I'm 60 this year. Scares the fire out of me. And I know some of you are beyond 60, but I never thought, I mean, 60, it's scary. Because I never saw, my, Becky, I never saw myself being, if I thought of myself as being 60 back whenever we were kids, I would think, you know, that's time to, you know, you got to, in a wheelchair or something, you know. I, I thought 60 was really old. And, and I, for some of you young ones, you probably think you are old. <laughs> but it's time that we get serious. And it's time that we come back to core. It's time that we come back to the very beginning that God has described for us. I want to share a message with you today that God put in my heart about 20 years ago when I was still serving at First Baptist Church of Ocala. And John, God has never let this message leave me. And it has been ever developing. God has ever given me more knowledge and more understanding of this passage the more that I research it. But I'm getting to a place where I realize there's got to be more to life and there's got to be more to worship. There's got to be more to God than what we're experiencing. And there is. Yeah. And there is. Yeah. This thing called worship has become a conversation today that we didn't have 15, 20 years ago. There are blogs, there are books, there's even a genre. I mean, there's everything in the world that you can read, listen to, hear, watch, observe about worship. But this conversation is relatively new to the church. The church has never really understood nor learned what our role is in worship the way that we know it to be today. And I'm so thankful that we're having this conversation. This thing called worship... Do we really truly have our own philosophy, our own understanding, our own biblical way of explaining what worship is? In other words, if I were to come to you today and say, what is your belief about worship? Can you give me a good, solid, biblical definition of worship? I want you to think about it. Can you give us a good, solid, biblical definition of worship? If, we could, if you could, what would it sound like? What would it be? I know that I never learned the biblical definition of worship in Sunday school. I'm telling you the truth. And I, by the way, I was Southern Baptist nine months before I took my first breath. <laughs> I've been Southern Baptist a long time. I mean, I came up through the system. I mean, I was a beginner and a primary and an intermediate. You remember, some of y'all remember all that? I mean, I remember singing, Jesus wants me for a son, be my son, be. I mean, I go way back. So I've been Southern Baptist a long time. I grew up through the system. I mean, I went to a Southern Baptist University. And then I went to a Southern Baptist cemetery, a seminary. <laughs> Served churches for over 30 years and now for 14 years been working for a Southern Baptist institution. But pastor, nobody ever taught me the true biblical understanding and definition of worship. I never grew up as a minister of music, Becky, with a biblical philosophy of worship. I grew up as a minister of music. I grew up thinking that there's a way to do music in the church. And you go and you do music. You teach people how to sing. You teach people how to, 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 to develop their musical skills. And you do music for the sake of ministering to people. And you do music for the sake of reaching people with the gospel. That's what I thought it was. And it is about those things, but it's not just about those things. So it's time that we get back. Do we really understand what true worship is? I read this recently. It's a quote from a book called God's Passion for His Glory. For thousands of people and many pastors, the event of worship on Sunday morning is conceived of as a means to accomplish something other than worship. We worship to raise money. We worship to attract crowds. 
We worship to heal human hurts, to recruit workers, to improve church morale, to give talented musicians an opportunity to fulfill their calling, to teach our children the way of righteousness, to help our marriages stay together, to evangelize the lost, to motivate people for service projects, to give our churches a family feeling. But in all of this, we realize and we bear witness that we truly do not know what worship is. George Barna, in a book called Revolution that he wrote about seven or eight years ago, wrote this. This is George Barna, that great research uh, guru in, uh, that, that wrote this book called Revolution. This is what he says. He says, one of the greatest frustrations of his life has been the disconnection between what research consistently shows about church Christians... And what the Bible calls us to be. He says, let's take a look at the condition of 77 million American adults who are churched, born-again Christians regarding worship. This is what his research has revealed. The bi-weekly attendance at worship service is, by believers' own admission, generally the only time they worship God. Eight out of every ten believers do not feel that they have entered the presence of God or even experienced a, a genuine connection with Him during that service. It's His research. 77 million American adults. Half of all believers say they, they do not feel that they have entered the presence of God or even encountered a genuine connection with Him during the past year. Woe is the church. Woe is us. We go to church and we follow a form. We go to church and we follow a liturgy. You say, well, we're not liturgical. Oh, yes, we are. We have a form, you understand. If we get off of the form, by the way, many times we'll pray, Lord, let something happen today that's not in the bulletin. <laughs> And what that prayer represents is we have a form that we follow. You, you sing a few songs, you pray a few prayers, you take up an offering, you do all these things because this is how you worship. That's the way we were trained. That's the way we were brought up in the church. There's a form to worship. Let me give you a good working definition of worship. And if you do not have a good working definition of worship, you ought to memorize this one. Matter of fact, I'm going to say it, I'm going to quote it, and then I want you to repeat it after me because I want this to kind of get embedded in your savvy. Is that good? Will you repeat after me? Not now. Let me read it first, and then I want you to follow me, and you're going to repeat it later. I love this. It came from Louis Giglio's book, The Air I Breathe. It's a great little book by Louis Giglio. This is his working definition of worship. And of all the ones I've ever read, Pastor, I love this one the most because it's so biblically practical. Watch this. Worship is our response both personal and corporate to God for who He is and what He has done in our lives, expressed by the things we say and the way we live. It's a response. I'll say it again. Let me say it again so you can kind of get it wrapped in your system. And then I want you to repeat after me. Worship is our response to God for who He is and what He has done in our lives, expressed by, we have to say it, we have to speak it, we got to tell it, right? Expressed by the things we say and the way we live. Isn't that good? Amen. Okay, fine. <laughs> I think it's great. Now, here we go. You ready? I want you all to re repeat after me. Would you be willing to do that? Yes. Worship, is Worship is our response, our response to, God to God for who He is. And what he has done in our lives. Expressed by the things we say and the way we live. Now you've heard a good working definition of worship. It's really good for you now to begin to search scripture to find your biblical working definition of worship. If you don't have one, you need to develop one. And when you do, just be certain that you develop it from scripture. So this thing called worship, this thing called the Great Commandment. I'm going to call this message today, Pastor, Worship 
on demand. Now, I'll, I'll couch that in a minute. You'll understand why I mean, what I mean in just a minute. Worship on demand. And out of the honor of the reading of God's Word, I'm going to ask you to stand. And I'm going to begin to read Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. And uh, I want you to hear the words from this passage. Matter of fact, there are some significant words in this passage that you need to hear God say. Typically, the only time I've ever heard this passage preached is for um, children's dedication, baby dedication, messages that relate to raising or rearing children, because this is such a foundational verse in Scripture, but I want you to hear it with fresh ears. I want you to read it with fresh eyes. Hear what he's saying to the church today. Here we go. Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9. Now, this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you're crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God, to keep all of his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now he gets busy. He gets serious. You shall, excuse me, excuse me, my bad. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. I skipped one. The Lord your God is one. I got that one, didn't I? Okay, good. That was my ADD coming out. See the squirrel? Back to end these words. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. You want to go back to core? You want to go back to foundation? You want to go back to what God deems necessary? You want to go back to the main thing? Let's go back to God's first and great commandment. Let's go back to his statutes and his judgments. Let's go back to this thing that he commanded for us to observe. Called the great commandment. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And this is not the time of invitation, by the way. This is just the opening prayer. Let's ask God to bless this message this morning. Father, you've been good to us. You have blessed us. This is the day that you have made and we really have no choice in the matter but to rejoice and to be glad in it. We thank you for that. Thank you for the worship that we've already encountered today for John's leadership. Thank you for Pastor Jeff and how he's leading this church. Thank you, Father, for this special invitation to come and share. And Lord, thank you for these fine people here today. I pray that you would take these words. I pray that you would take your words and you would multiply them. I, I pray that you would take them and develop them in our lives. And Lord, may we never forget who you are, what you have to say to us, and what you desire to do in our lives. We love you, and it's in your very precious name that I pray. Amen. Amen. So here God has given us this first and great of all commandments. Now in this passage, here's what I'm getting from this passage. There's an if-then principle. And you know, he's kind of loaded in Scripture with the if-then principle. If we will respond, if we will obey, if we will do, he usually follows with promises. Then he comes through. But it's the if-then principle. Now in this if-then principle, he says, if you will obey, if you will observe this commandment, he's teaching us in this passage that he will follow with some promises. Do you believe that God is a God of his promise? Do you believe that God's promises are sure? Do you believe that God's promises are complete? Can you trust his promises? When the heavenly father looks at you and I, can he trust that we're going to observe and obey? It's not in our nature, is it? It's not in who we are to be obedient to anything. And we test that from the very day we take our first steps. I've raised two children, 
And now I'm helping to raise five grandchildren. And what I can tell you is this. Little ones resist obedience. They just do. You know why they do? It's in their nature. We were raised with a sin nature. And we were raised to, to question authority. We were, que we were raised to question whether we are to obey something or not because we want our way, right? I mean, it's human nature. It's my way. It's mine, me, mine, mine, mine. <laughs> Have you heard of mine? And we resist doing the right thing for the benefit of myself, desiring for me, myself, to have something or to experience something my way. Not a lot different in the churches today. I've been around church a long time. And there's a lot of I, me, my, mine people in the church. Matter of fact, all you got to do is go to some committee meetings. <laughs> and those four personal pronouns, if you were to take them out of our vocabulary, there's not a lot of conversation that would happen in those committee meetings. I, me, my, mine. And what we've got to understand is it's not about me. And it's not about you. We don't come to church singing, Have mine own way, Lord. Have mine own way. No, it's have thine own way, dear Lord. Not my way. Not my opinion. Not my preference. And we do sing that song. We bring the preference of our praise into the house. Uh -huh. They're not singing my favorite songs. They're not bringing my preference of praise into the house of the Lord. Well, we can't. We're not supposed to. We're to bring the sacrifice of our praise into the house of the Lord. And a sacrifice means that we've got to sacrifice our own opinion. We've got to sacrifice our own preferences. We've got to sacrifice our own thoughts in the best interest of others, according to Scripture. We're thinking in the best interest of others, not ourselves. It's not about me. It's about God, absolutely. Now, so it's this if then principle. And in this passage, these promises that God gives us, they are so incredible. He says, if you will just observe this one thing that I'm teaching you to do, if you will just love me with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind in the New Testament, and then in this Old Testament, he says, with all of your strength. That's every fiber of our being. Now, he's not asking for much. He just wants it all. All heart, all soul, all mind, all strength, all the time. He wants it all. I mean, after all, he gave his all, and he simply wants our all in return. That's worship. Loving him, giving him, responding to him with everything that we have within us. I just wasn't raised that way. You're right. You're right, and I wasn't either. That's the issue. We were not raised the way the Bible teaches us to be able to worship God and respond to God. We were not raised that way. And shame, shame on us. Absolutely. We should have done a better job of teaching our people to be obedient to this command. To give Him everything that we have within us. We think that the best posture of worship is this. Some think the best posture of worship is this. No, that's not what he's teaching us. Now, so he says, if you will obey, if you will observe this command, I will follow with three promises. Here they are. First of all, he says, your days will be prolonged. Your days will be prolonged. Who doesn't want the extension of life? Who doesn't want to have quality of life longer? We all want the extension of life. Matter of fact, people pay thousands of dollars to extend their life both medically as well as cosmetically. Why? Because we want to extend life. And we want to have it more abundant. Amen? He says, I'll give it to you if you'll just be obedient. Just obey. Love me. Worship me. And I will give you long life. Number two, and by the way, that, that, that extension of life, it could mean a lot of things. It could be that the days, your days might have been numbered at 20 years, and he says, I'm going to prolong it because you've been obedient, and you may live 30, 40, 50, who knows? Your, the number of your days on this earth might have been 50. 
And he may say, you know what, I'm going to extend your life. I'm going to prolong your life to 80 or beyond. Who knows? Who, who knows what the prolonging or the extending of life means? I don't know what that means. He just says, I'll prolong your life. And I believe him, don't you? Amen. It's a promise. And it's in the word of God. Isn't that good? I didn't write this stuff, pastor. I didn't write this. The second promise is this. He says, I'll give you the land that you're crossing over to possess. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. <laughs> I'll give you the land that you're crossing over to possess. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. Look what he gave you. I mean, this storefront property, I'm telling you, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's flowing all out there. Six lanes of it right out there. <laughs> Six lanes of milk and honey right out there. And all we've got to do is go reach them, Pastor. I mean, the milk and honey's flowing right now. I'm looking out there, it's flowing. There it goes. <laughs> it's out there. Next yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thirdly, he says, if you'll just obey, if you'll just be obedient to this one command, I'm telling you, the cure all, fix all to the church's woes is wrapped up right here in this final promise. Because it's something that leaders, pastors, denominational leaders, seminary professors have been researching, trying to develop, and you can go to conferences. I mean, you pay big money to go to a church growth conference. You pay big money to, to read books on how to grow a church. I'm telling you, God has already settled how to grow a church. I'm telling you, God has already settled how to grow people. God has already settled how to, to, how to multiply the kingdom. He's already, he's already told us. If you'll observe this one command, you'll multiply greatly. I mean, your enthusiasm over that is very contagious. Makes me want to join you. Multiply greatly. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? If you will just observe this one command, you'll multiply greatly. Oh, he didn't say if you'll just offer a bunch of church study courses and get people to graduate from all these study courses. He didn't say if you'll go out there and memorize a gospel presentation. He didn't say that. He didn't say if you'll just show up to church every Sunday. He didn't say if you'll show up to Tuesday night visitation. He didn't say any of that. He didn't say you'll go on missions once a year. He didn't say if you'll become a missionary. He didn't say any of that. He said if you will observe this one command, if you'll fall in love with me with everything that you have within you, you will multiply greatly. Now, either that's a promise or it's not. And I guarantee you one thing, it's not a promise if we don't pursue it. They're just words in a book. They're just words in a book. It's only a promise if we pursue it. It's only a promise if we obey it. Are you listening to me? You will multiply greatly. Say that. You will multiply again. You will multiply greatly. Not because you're reaching people, but because you're reaching heaven. Oh, don't get me excited. I didn't write this. It's what he said. Now, either we're going to take him at his word, or we're just going to have nice little Sunday school lessons. Which would you rather do? Have nice little Sunday school lessons, or believe his word? Believe, believe his word. Believe his promise. He says three promises. If you will obey, then I will follow with these promises. Now, what we have, this is what man's done with this, Pastor. This is what we have done in our denomination. And I'm one of them. This is what we have done. We have said, God, you know, you, you got some really good ideas. <laughs> you, you, you've got some really good plans. But we're Americans. This is America. And we know what it means to grow things in America. I mean, after all, we've got American ingenuity. We've got American enterprise. We know how to grow things, God. We got this. We got it, God. We got it. So about, I don't know, 60, 80 years ago, actually Southern Baptist Convention was formed in 1883. I know that, somehow. <laughs> I don't remember how or where, but 
We've been around since the late 1800s. And what we decided a long, long time ago was we're a Great Commission denomination. We're a Great Commission denomination. And you know what? We must be about the Great Commission. Oh, hear me. We must be about the Great Commission. For see, God gave us this Great Commission as a mandate. And when He gave us this Great Commission, here's what He said. I want you to take who I am, God, I want you to take my gospel that you'll find in the Word right here. I want you to take what I did for Jesus Christ on the cross, and I want you to take it to all the world. That's what He told us to do. And teach and baptize. Make disciples. For this is the first and great of all commandments. No. That's not what He said. I cannot take the Scriptures. I can't take away from or add to the Scriptures, can I? He didn't say that. So we've got this great commission that the church must be about. And here's what we have done. God, we got this. We're going to take this great commission. We're the great commission church. We're going to take this great commission and we're going to reach the world for you. We're going to do it, God. We got it. We're going to take care of this. So we put together and we implemented all these great programs that we can teach people how to evangelize. We can teach people how to go into all the world and baptize and be missionaries on this globe and on this planet. This is how we're going to grow a church. This is how we're going to grow a kingdom. This is how we're going to reach the world for Jesus Christ. We're going to take this to everybody. So we've been developing this great commission for a long time. All of our resources, all of our personnel, all of our tactics, and all of our strategies, all of our technologies, we're funneling and pushing them through this great commission. And we've been doing that for years, for generations. We've been pushing everything that we have, all of our resources, through this great commission. Oh, don't hear me say that we're not supposed to be about the great commission. Yes, we are. But there is a perspective. And there is an order. God's order, not ours. So man has taken this great commission and we've put everything that we have in and through this great commission. Now watch. So my question for the church today is, okay, that's wonderful. But what are we doing to fulfill this first and great of all commandments? We're the tactics. We're the strategies. We're the resources. Where's the budget? Where's the personnel? What are we doing in the local church to fulfill the first and great of all commandments? What are we doing? Are we, are we doing the same amount that we are with the Great Commission? I say nay, nay. At least I don't see the budgets. I don't see the resources. I don't see the strategies. I don't see the tactics. I don't see churches that are saying, you know what, we've got to be about this great commandment. I don't see that emphasis. We're still pushing this great commission, which is wonderful, but we're kind of out of order. For, and, and by the way, uh, do you believe that God's order is chronological? <coughs> Hello? Yeah. Do you believe that God's priorities are in a, a vertical line? Do you believe that every time God gave us a command, that he, he put things in a ranked order? God bless your ministries. I want to read something to you. First of all, he calls this the first and great commandment. He went chronological before we did. That word first is a chronology. Do you understand? And he chose that very specific word for a specific reason. He says this is the first and great commandment. And if you were to go back to Matthew 22, and you were to look it up in his word, and you took down... That, that, that you just drill down on the, that very specific word called first, here's what you're going to find. Oh, you can look it up for yourself because I want you to test this against Scripture. When he says this is the first commandment, that word first in the Greek language of Matthew 22, that word first is the word protos. And that word protos in our language is the word foremost. This is what it means. It means foremost in time, place, order, or importance. Sounds like a chronology to me, doesn't you? Time, place, order, importance. It means before, at the beginning, chiefly, at the first, first of all. 
That's vertical, loving God, responding to God, obedient to God, observing this command first. Sounds like an order to me by definition. Second, he says, is like unto it that you go and love your neighbor as yourself. So do you believe that loving God and loving others, loving people are the same? Many do. Right. This is the same. You can't have one without the other, right? I say nay, nay. According to what I read in Scripture. So first is foremost. It's protos. It's first of all. Now let's watch the chronology. You want to? He said second is like unto it. Now that word second in the language is the word deuteros. And that word deuteros in the language is our word ordinal. Here's the true definition, the English language definition of the word second, ordinal. Here's what it means. It means a specified order or rank in a series. Hello? Sounds like a chronology to me, doesn't it you? The church has not been taught, pastor. That's why I'm here today. To be a voice to you to say, we've not been obedient to God's command. And we're out of order. It's a specified order or rank in a series. He says it's second. This is the definition. Look it up. Second in time, place, or rank. Afterwards, second or secondarily. Wow. And so what we've done, we said, we got it, God. We're a great commission denomination. And we're going to take this first thing and we're going to lay it right over here. And we're going to elevate that first thing. I mean, we're going to lower that first thing and we're going to put the great commission right there. Boom. Because we got this. This is how we're going to grow it. And all the while, God is saying, I don't want you to be responsible for the increase. I don't want you to be responsible for the growth. He says, I want you to be responsible to be obedient. And here's what he said. And I will give the increase. Oh, yeah. He says, I want the responsibility. I want the honor. I want the privilege. I will give the increase. You just obey. You just observe. You just do this one thing that I've asked you to do. Love me. Adore me. Worship me with everything that you have within you. Now, here's the thing about the face value of a commission and a command. I'm almost done, Pastor. I really am. <laughs> I got to drive to Fort Walton Beach this afternoon. Where are y'all going? <laughs> now, watch this. This is eternity, all right? Watch this. A commission by its very definition is this. Look it up. When God gave us the, the, the uh, uh, Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, this commission, if you look at it, a ter the term commission is this, is what God gave us. It's a duty, it's a task, it's an assignment. God gave us the assignment to go. Now, what happens whenever people give us an assignment? We've got to get it done, right? Pass, fail is based on the completion of the assignment, Right? So he gave us a task. He gave us a duty. He gave us a responsibility. He gave us an assignment. Now, what typically happens when somebody hands us an assignment? The very first question many of us ask when we're given an assignment, here's your assignment. The very first question that we generally ask is what? When's it due? We know we got to get it done, but when's it due? Now, the reason why I'm calling this worship on demand is because of this great commandment. Because when you look at the face value of the term command or commandment, just look at the vocabulary. Here's what it means. It's an order. It's a demand. Now that carries a totally different weight of a word. That definition is different than an assignment. It's an order. It's a demand. What's a, what's a first response to a demand? What's a first response to an order? We never ask, when's it due? You do it. It's an order. It's a demand. And so we've taken these two terms and we have readjusted them for the American enterprise, this American ingenuity, this thing that we know that we can do. This is how we're going to grow churches. And this is where it's gotten us. In the last 30 years, statisticians are saying that the average Protestant church in America now is 80 plus percent plateaued and declining. And in the last six or eight years, Dr. Ed Stetzer at Lifeway has made this research, and this is what he's discovered. That 80 percent that's been kind of plateaued for about 20-something years, he said it is now moving closer to 90 percent. 
Protestant churches in America are now nearly 90% plateaued and declining. What we have done is we've divided and subdivided enough. You know what I mean by that? We have divided and subdivided enough that we're all over the place, but we're just not growing. We're just not growing. We're exchanging growth is what we're doing. But we're not growing. We're not reaching the world. And so this thing called the Great Commission and this thing called the Great Commandment, here's the reality. We're almost 90% plateaued and declining. Folks, if I were a CEO of a major corporation and my corporation were 80 to 90% plateaued and declining, I'd be, be hearing the voice of Donald Trump saying, you're fired. You're not getting it done. How would you like your bank account to be 90% plateaued and declining? How would you like your retirement to be 80 to 90% plateau to declining? I guarantee you one thing, if it were, you'd pause, you'd stop, and immediately do something about it. Right? right? right. Immediately you'd make a change. You'd do something different. You can't multiply if you're dividing and multiplying. If you're, if you're declining, if you're plateaued and declining, you can't multiply. And by the way, where there's obedience, there's multiplication. And if you look at a church or if you look at a life, if you look at believers, you look at ministries and they're not multiplying, you know what that means? They're not obeying. Are you listening? Are you listening? They're not obeying this command. You say, I sure wish it hurry up and finish. Okay, I am. So here's what he's saying in this passage. Worship me, love me with everything that you have within you and I will give you these three promises. Wait. Then what you find in this scripture is this. He says, you shall. And he says, you shall eight times from verse 5 through verse 8. He said, uh, 9 through verse 9, he says, you shall eight times. And you know what he means by that? You shall. You shall love me. You shall speak of me. You shall talk about me when you walk by the way. You shall talk about me when you lay down at night. You shall talk about me when you raise up in the morning. You shall teach us to your children. You shall teach us to your grandchildren. You know why he's so confident to say you shall? By the way, that word you shall, if we were to say it in our vernacular, here's what he would say. In today's language, you're gonna. Oh, yeah, you are. You're, you're going to. And you know why he's so confident to say you're going to? Because later in that New Testament, he says, there's coming a day when every knee That's right. is going to bow. And every tongue is going to confess. Every tongue is going to recognize that he is God. There's coming a day when you're going to. That's how confident he is. You shall. Now then, watch this. If we become... Obedient. If we'll observe this command, he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to bind it as a sign on your hand. You know what that means? Everything you put your hand to do, everything by the work that you do, everything that you touch is going to reveal. Every activity, everything that you build, Every mission trip that you go on, every time you go out and spread the gospel, every time you connect with somebody, anything that you touch with your hand, you bind it right there, is going to reveal that I love God. It's going to reveal that I'm being obedient to this command. It's going to reveal whose I am. Every time I touch something, it reveals who I am. You know what else he said? He says, put it right there between your eyes. Boom, right there. Oh, he's not saying put a little red dot. It's not what he said. He says, you're going to wear your obedience. You're going to wear your love of God right here. And it means that everywhere you go, everybody you pass, everyone you come in contact with is going to see that in you. They're going to see it on your faces. They're going to see it revealed through the things that you do. They're going to see it by the way that you talk. They're going to know by the way you reveal His presence in you. It's going to be seen. It's going to be felt. It's going to be caught. Amen? And then he says, write it on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. You know what that means? It means when, when, you, when you go home, if there's nothing on the front end of your house, I'm, it may be talking physical, I don't know. But what it reveals is this. People who pass by your neighborhood, that go by your home, or go by your apartment, 
they know that the people who live in that place right there, those people love God. Those people get up on Sundays and go to church. I know that if I have a real need, I can go to those people and they'll help me because they love God. It's going to reveal. He didn't say just put it on the doorpost of your house. He said even put it on your gates. That means if you've got a farm and they can't see your house, put it on your gate. So when they pass by, they know that you love God. I'm almost done. I keep saying that. I really am. I'm, I'm almost done. So now we get to the very back of the book. Oh, by the way, we do have the great commission. We have this great commandment. But what I believe is where we are as a church today, we found our way to a third component, and that is the great assumption. We just assume that people love God to that degree. We just assume that people are already being obedient to this command. The great assumption. Oh, they wouldn't come to church on Sundays if they didn't love God to this degree, right? Oh, they wouldn't come to our rehearsals. They wouldn't come to our visitation. They wouldn't come to our events. They wouldn't do what they're doing if they didn't love God, right? If they were not being obedient to this command, they wouldn't be here, right? The great assumption. So we find ourselves now at the back of the book. We get to the very, very, very end of the book. And this is what Jesus says. Jesus looks down in all of our busyness, in all of our labor, in all of our activity. Of course, many are retired. We don't work as hard as we used to, right? They see us in our busyness. They see us in our labor. They see us in our activities. All the things that we're doing for the kingdom. To grow a church. To make an impact. All these things that we're doing, Jesus looks back, and you don't need to turn there, but you'll recognize it, in Revelation chapter 2, and this is Jesus. He wrote it in red in my Bible. In other words, he died to say this. And he looks at me, and he looks at you. And if I were the only one in the room, if you were the only one in the room, he'd be speaking to you, and he'd be speaking to me right now. This is what he said. I, Jesus, know your works. I know your labor. You have persevered for my name's sake and you've not become weary. You're working hard. You're doing good. But then he gives us three daunting words in that passage. The first daunting word is, I've seen how busy you are. But nevertheless, that's the first daunting word. Nevertheless. I, Jesus, have this against you. You have left, he goes chronological, you have left your first love. Here's the second daunting word. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. What does that imply? What does fallen imply? Remember where you fell. What does that imply? Huh? Remember where you didn't do the work. Remember where you were not obedient. Remember where you did not fulfill this first and great command. Go back. Remember. Go back. He says you've missed the mark. You fell. What does miss the mark mean? It's a definition of what? We've not been obedient. Failure. Remember where you fell. And then he gives us a third daunting word. Repent. He said repent. And go back and do the chronological again. Go back and do the first works or else I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. You know what he, mean by, he means by lampstand? I'll remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. It's the light of influence. I'll take your influence away and I'll give it to somebody else. I'll remove your influence. I'll remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. And I can tell you this right now based on what I read, but I understand what I hear and what I know about our culture. We have lost our lampstand. We have lost our influence. God has taken it away and he's given it to somebody else. All you got to do is look at our morality or lack thereof. All you got to do is watch our politics. All you got to do is see what's going on in the world around us and what's coming to our nation. All you got to do is understand how the decline, what kind of a decline that we're in right now for us to understand that he's already removed our lampstand. Pastors used to have the highest level of respect, the highest level of influence in a community used to be senior pastors, not anymore. The church used to have the highest level of respect, the highest level of influence in a culture, not anymore. 
Not anymore. We've lost our lampstand. He's already removed it. You know why he removed it? Because we were not obedient. If you're not going to get serious about it, I'll go to somebody else who will. Eighty to ninety percent plateaued and declining. It ain't working. We got to find a way to fix it. He's already given it to us. I'm almost done. Carry <laughs> on. No, no, seriously, we got to go, and I got to respect this, and I'm sorry, Pastor. And if you don't believe that God is a God of chronology and order, Jesus said it. He didn't say it, but you'll find it in the New Testament. He did too say it. Seek ye. It's a chronology, folks. And by the way, that's vertical. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then he gives us the dividend. He gives us the payoff. If you seek him first, all these things will be added unto you. He gives you another one. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. By the way, when we pray, it's vertical, right? You're seeking heaven. You're seeking him. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man does what? It's another dividend. It's another payoff. If you just seek him first. Do we understand what this means? There is a chronology. And if I were preparing for the Olympics, and I wanted to win one of those medals, uh, uh, the, the gold, the, the silver, and the bronze, and all that we've been doing as a church, all that we've been doing as a denomination, everything that we've been trying to accomplish, working hard to fulfill this great commission, you know where it would get us in the race of the Olympics? We would fulfill, second is like unto it, that you go love your neighbors yourself, and the only medal that we would take home is the silver. I don't know about you, but when I get to heaven one day, and there are trophies and crowns and medals that we can lay at the feet of Jesus. I want him to know that I was obedient. And I would rather give him my gold medal. Instead of that number two medal. That silver medal. Amen? Amen. 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 Now. Where does this leave you today? What is our response to this commandment? What, are, what is our response to God in worship? Our response should be this. All to Jesus I surrender. Is that word? All to Him I freely give. Don't get ahead of me. I will ever go to Tuesday night visitation. I will ever Memorize that presentation. I will ever go to the work of missions. Can I say this? That if we love Him, we will go. If we love Him, we will do. If we love Him, we will memorize. If we love Him, we will share. No longer do we have to use negative motivational tactics to get people to accomplish the Great Commission. God's going to do it through us if we will just obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Church, do you want to go back to the core? Do you want to go back to the beginning? Do you want to go back to first things first? Do you want to make the main thing the main thing? Do you want God to do the work through you? Do you want to benefit from His promises? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Pastor's going to be standing here. Any other person who would like to come up and receive? And I can tell you this about worship. Real worship always leads to a response. Real worship always always leads to a response. What is your response to the Word today? Father, we love you. We're grateful. We're thankful for this opportunity to come and share. Now, God, I pray that you do something that only you can do in our lives, that you provide spiritual transformation through your Holy Word. We're praying for that today, and we're eager and anxious to see the response to this worship today. 
We love you. And it's in your precious name I pray. Amen.